it's so, so lovely to be here and welcome everybody for this evening's um, in conversation. I'm very much excited for this. So I hope um, it will be as enjoyable for you as I know it will be enjoyable for me, but welcome. So um, I would like to welcome today the amazing uh, panelists. So we have Amy Condon and um, Carol Collett. And Amy is a designer by training who has been working and researching in the field of biofabrication for over 10 years. She holds an MA in Material Futures and a PhD from Central St. Martins. Her PhD research in uh, tissue engineered um, textiles was conducted in collaboration with King's College London in the tissue engineering and biophotonics, bio sorry, <laughs> uh, <laughs> department based at Guy's um, Hospital. Amy received her introductory uh, training in tissue engineering at the world-renowned Symbiotica based at the University of Western Australia. Um, her work has been featured globally in leading pu publications and books and in exhibitions held at venues including the Copper Hewitt Smithsonian Museum in New York, uh, the Saint Pompidou in Paris and Science Gallery in London. In her professional career, Amy has worked both in industry and in-house at biotech startup Modern Metal as Associate Director of Materials Design. Amy is current Head of Design Intelligence at Biofabricate. Biofabricate, am I saying? Yes. Biofabricate, yeah. <laughs> Thank you. Um, a global network serving the needs of biomaterial innovators, investors, and consumer brands. Biofabricate's vision is a sustainable material world built with biology, not oil. So that's Amy and you from this very short intro you know what to expect from this evening. Now Carol, Carol Collett is a professor in design for sustainable futures and director of Maison O or Maison Zero, um, the Central St. Martin's LVMH creative platform for regenerative luxury originally set up in 2017. She's also co-director of the Living Systems Lab Research Group at Central St. Martin's University of the Arts, London. As an educator, she has pioneered the integration of sustainability in the curriculum by creating new courses such as MA Textile Futures in 2001, now Material Futures, the MA Biodesign in 2018, and has recently launched a newly uh, a new fully online MA in regenerative design at Central St. Martins. She supervises PhD for design inquiries related to ecology and living systems, such as um, Amy. Uh, as a design researcher, Carol founded the Living Systems Lab in 2013 to develop new knowledge in the field of ecology and biodesign. She curated the first international exhibition that explores biodesign by the lens of sustainability in 2013, and that was called Alive New Design Frontiers EDF Foundation. Um, Carol's own biodesign research work has been featured in international exhibitions, and recent shows include the Pompidou Center, and that was La Fabrique du Vivant 2019, the Biotopia Museum, 2020, 2021, and the C CID Grand Renu Plant um, Fever 2020, 21. She has also published her work in academic journals, book chapters, and is a regular keynote speaker on the subject of biodesign, biotextiles, future biofacturing, regenerative design, design for climate and biodiversity emergencies. So, I mean, wow, what a phenomenon panelists we have today and again I'm so excited so let's get started um, again Amy and Carol thank you so much um, for for joining me in this in conversation and I'll start um, well what I thought I have a, a few questions that I'm going to be asking but I thought because this is an in conversation um, let's keep it very informal. I think that's always much nice, especially um, on Zoom. So um, if I ask one question, say for Amy, Carol, please feel free to come and join in whenever you have something to contribute. And that goes the same with you, Amy, if I ask something straight to Carol. I mean, I know you both have so much to say for this whole um, 
subject of research today. And equally for our um, audience, if you have any questions, just uh, please use the chat and uh, Marketa and Lynn will be here helping us with your questions. So we'll have right at the end uh, a Q&A, but please do um, ask your, your questions as we go along. So, okay, get starting. So um, Amy, first question. Why did you decide to do a practice-based PhD? That's a really good question, and it's all Carol's fault, basically. No. I mean, it, it, it partly is. Um, I think when I started, when I was studying design, I didn't realize that research was something you could do as a career. I think that was probably very common, especially on my undergraduate. And then I did the um, MA Textile Futures, as it was known when I did it. And then um, towards the end of that, Carol said, I really think you should think consider doing a PhD. And at the time I was like, nope, I'm done. I've st I'm studied out, I'm fine. And then I went away, did a residency at the Symbiotica, learned how to tissue culture and was just so fascinated in the area. I knew I wanted protected time to do more research. And there wasn't really a field that you could go and work in for biodesign. There were, there were some companies emerging, but there wasn't really an industry to go into. So I decided that I really wanted to keep researching this area and a PhD would be a good, a good way to do that. And I mean, it, it had to be practice based with, um, with the work that I wanted to do. And I was, you know, it was an obvious choice to do it at St. Martin's with all of its sort of history of looking at biodesign and, and uh, biomanufacture and, and things like that. So that's what sort of drove the decision. It was a real desire to keep researching and to have protected time to do that, really. Yes, no, that's such a good point, isn't it? Once you, you get into the work, finding that time to, to invest in research can be quite difficult. And I mean, this is a, almost like an obvious answer, but why did you choose Carol? as your supervisor and what was the process like to actually apply to the PhD? I mean, there wasn't anybody else that I would, that would have been, Carol was in the perfect fit and the only fit for director of studies with all of her incredible experience and expertise. And also knowing me and my work and the development of that, it was just the, the natural fit. Um, so it was a case of, I mean, I was, I think very lucky um, in, you know, in a lot of instances, particularly in science, I think, um, and maybe not so much in design is that you often when you apply for a PhD, you're applying for a set PhD position, maybe within a research grant. So it's already just uh, sort of pre prescribed for you what you're going to be looking at. And I, and I would, with St. Martin's, I could provide my own research um, sort of topic or idea which was really important for me because there wasn't because I knew what I wanted to look at and I wanted to look at the crossover between sort of textiles and tissue engineering so it was a process of putting together an application obviously making sure that Carol was uh, interested in in supervising me and then applying through the, sort of the normal route and um, the, one of the, the other key things that happened once I got onto the PhD program, though, was finding a lab to collaborate with. And that was definitely a longer process, but finding it was the sort of natural fit for the home to be St. Martin's and, and the, in the Design and Living Systems lab, particularly with Carol. Amazing. And Carol, what do you look when you accept a PhD candidate? I mean, you already knew Amy from her MA and you obviously had suggested to her, um, you know, that she should take over and continue her research, but how do you go about choosing your PhD candidates? Um, before I answer that, I wanted to add a little bit to what <clears throat> Amy just said, because I think the um, one of the, Amy's being very modest here, but one of the challenges as well is that um, she and a few others uh, on the Textile Futures course uh, were really ahead of their times in terms of thinking of where are we going next in terms of future making. Um, and, and Amy had really already displayed all the sort of relevant kind of uh, parameters to be, to be a good researcher. But I think what was really impressive as well is that, yes, of course, you know, I was supporting that kind of work, but when Amy applied, it was before we had a bio lab at Central St. Martins. Uh, we now have a bio lab, which we've set up when we set up our new MA in biodesign three years ago. But at the time, 
you know, Amy and like me, we were just doing a lot of mucking about in this sort of DIY home base. Yeah, I should have said I applied in, well, I think I started in 20, 2012. So oh, it was wow. Like, okay. No, I did it part time. So it took me a long time. But yeah, there was definitely no bio lab. I mean, there was talk of like, wouldn't that be great? But it was a lot of yeah. trying to figure out where you could do the work. And there was no sort of bio lab really anywhere that kind of really had already embedded this. And so I think the challenge, which is not usual to all PhDs, but, but for Amy, the challenge was to find a partner lab mm -hmm. that mm -hmm. would welcome a designer in a scientific lab environment. Um, and I have to say, I think Amy found not only just the right university, the right lab, but also the right uh, scientist who co-supervised all along. So she became mm -hmm. part of the team and Lucy was um, uh, instrumental to the mm -hmm. development of the project. Uh, by her passion, her knowledge, but you know the fact that she welcomed open armed mm -hmm. someone she didn't really know very yeah. much about come in my lab. And you know when you know how uh, scientists work, you know the, the protocols, following protocols in a lab, not disruptive someone else's uh, lab experiment is really critical. So that that was very <laughs> risky um, for Lucy to do this. But I, I thought it was um, so. And it, and it's you know when someone applies to a PhD in collaboration with another university, it's always up to the students applying to start the, <coughs> start the first conversations. <coughs> and I think um, Amy found the right spot, the right place and the right person. Mm -hmm. And I, I think that was quite instrumental. Uh, well, 100%. Um, it was, uh, she loves to tell the story, Lucy, uh, Professor loves to tell the story of this, this sort of random textile student going, can I come and speak to you? And her sort of pushing me off several times going, I'm not sure why you want to come and talk to me. Um, but I was, she had, her father used to be a bespoke tailor on Savile Row. So she had a love of textiles and an appreciation of making that I think not every scientist would have. And then as Carol said, she was just incredibly welcoming and supportive. Uh, all of her postdocs, they sort of opened the lab to me and treated me like I was another one of the researchers there, even when I was asking stupid questions or trying to figure out what it was that I was doing. But they were, it was really amazing, the support that was was given um, by Kings and, and to have Lucy as a supervisor was also fantastic. Um, and yeah, yeah, it was. Yeah, and that's why I wanted to really make that very clear you know when Isabella when you ask you know what what are you looking for were well, you looking for someone who's definitely really curious talented mm -hmm. and very creative but someone who's really committed and who can make things happen mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. who's not in a passive state waiting for things to be done because that's not how PhDs work you have to carve your way in through every new kind of um, challenge or any new kind of barrier and I think the first one for Amy was a big one is to find a, a science lab to to welcome her was a very big one but what I'm looking for generally is, is really um, people who have an interest in in a, a, and a passion for for knowledge and and to be at the edge of knowledge not just you know us, you know, enduring or, or kind of nurturing what we know already, because a PhD is, is the jargon we use. And, you know, for, for our audience is, you know, the PhD is really a quest for new knowledge uh, and, and for original significant contribution to new knowledge. And, and that sounds a bit weird if you haven't heard these terms before, but it's really looking at what can we add to um, the planet, <laughs> but it's profoundly humanist. It's, you know, what, how can we grow our knowledge as a species? And in what field do we contribute? So in the case of Amy, it's contributing to the field of both textile design and tissue engineering. Um, but so you need someone who's really hungry for that new knowledge, that news we thing, for someone who's not looking for pre-formatted recipes, things to follow, where you can simply be playful, experimental and creative, but someone who's after that new knowledge. And, and I think that's um, really the key, the, the, you know, the main skill set you need is that hunger for knowledge. Mm -hmm. uh, but you also want someone who's um, really interested in documenting their knowledge because in a practice-based PhD, you have to document mm -hmm. your 
how you develop your experiments, your practice. And so in the case of Amy, there was a lab book that was absolutely critical. But then you can um, explore that data, summarize that data in different ways. So the rigorous documentation of uh, the practice is not something you do on a BA or an MA. On a BA and MA, you develop your practice, you critic your practice. But that systematic documentation is also quite new. It's, it's something you really enjoy once you get into it. But it, it's kind of the new dimension of the MA. So you want someone who's interested in um, not just a quick try something, but someone who's going back, documenting, testing, redoing that recipe, retrying something until they get somewhere interesting. So that persistence, um, that creativity and that originality are, are really interesting. And for me, of course, I'm interested in um, anybody who's interrogating that intersection between living systems and design. Uh, whether it's through craft practice, through design, through the body. Um, I'm interested in ecology uh, overall, so really interested in new ways of making and new ways of thinking how we could even consider making in the future. Wow. Yes, yeah, so that's <laughs> not a, a, a small ask for a <laughs> candidate, is it? But Amy, you obviously had all that um, and more. So, and congratulations. I mean, I will be congratulating you throughout um, for starting that process, but then also concluding it. And, you know, it, it, sounds, it sounds like it was hard work even to get started. Definitely. I mean, I always, when people ask me what it's like, I think to do a PhD from a design as a practice-based standpoint, I say definitely in the beginning part, I felt like two thirds of the time you're doing the research and maybe the other third, you're figuring out how it's how you're doing what you're doing or are you doing the right thing and are you recording it in the correct way and, it, and understanding what methodology means because you've never had to explain that as a designer, you just have a method and it almost feels like you should, it's demystifying something if you talk about how you do what you do because it's not something that maybe you are you that you do in undergraduate and MA so you just think most some of the time you're just figuring out how is it that I'm doing what I'm doing and am I doing it in the right way <laughs> yeah. and especially if it's new research I suppose if there's not that blueprint of how to do something you also have to come up with your own methodology um yeah. And, and figure what the rigor then applies to that methodology. Absolutely. <laughs> wow, okay. So I think, the, I think it's the hardest thing in a PhD is having that mindset that mm -hmm. um, nobody knows. Mm -hmm. So it's not like you can knock on someone's door and say, how do you do this? You, yeah. Everything is something that you want to do. You've got to sort of discover what's the best protocol, whether it's lab-based or not, but you know, how do you do this? And, and your supervision team doesn't have the answer either. Yes. You know, the supervision team is here to accompany and nurture and challenge, but we don't, we can't say, no, no, it's, you can't do it that way. It's, you know, there isn't a blueprint. It's, you, you figure out a blueprint and it's a different one, of course, for different PhD, for every single PhD. Mm -hmm. uh, hence why the documentation is important, because if you get something really original and important, you, you want to know how you've done it. So you can transmit that knowledge and, and translate that knowledge. Yes, no, absolutely. Um, Amy, would you mind showing us a little bit of your research process? Of course. Let me see if I can get this screen share. So, can everyone see that? Beautiful. Yeah. The second most used phrase on Zoom uh, of the last two years, followed from "you're on mute." <laughs> um, <laughs> but I thought I would put this here because. Uh, to start off, which is um, a research question. So every PhD needs a research question. And mine was, can the integration of textile craft with tissue engineering techniques lead to the development of a new mater materiality for future design applications? So I was very, very interested in that crossover of skill sets. And what was really rewarding for the PhD and the outcome of it was that actually that it had, I think, uh, Sort of applications both in future design but also potentially in regenerative medicine so tissue engineering as a discipline is very closely linked with regenerative medicine which is trying to repair the human body in some way and ideally doing that with constructs which are biological in some way or biocompatible so that you're trying to repair the body uh, with something that's either living or will support the growth of something living you know whether it's everything from replacement by blood vessels to heart valves to any um to trying to fix bone it's so that's sort of where tissue engineering sits within science 
is predominantly trying to um to sort of look at, at repairing the body so this was I did a lot of drawing out when I was doing my PhD and this was one of the most useful ones and it came very late at the end but um where the sort of narrowing down where it sits so the it's really the work was at the intersection of tissue engineering textile craft specifically um and living materials and biofabrication so growing things using living materials for uh, for design and the, the work actually went through quite a journey. So I did, the, the PhD was um, part-time and it took me, uh, I think eight years to finish it in the end. So it was definitely not a quick process, but actually in hindsight, the way that I was, the work that I was doing, it was good that I didn't have to get it done in three because I mean, it took sort of a year to get a, um, this, a collaboration with King's College Lab set up. So it took some time to put that in place, but it really went through a transition from looking at speculative ideas of what we might do with tissue engineering. So the growing of new pieces for haute couture. So because of the complexity of the timelines involved with working with predominantly mammalian cells, although I did use some human cells, um, it's very much something that would sit in a luxury context within design rather than anything that's mass for a number of different reasons but before I could get into the lab I was doing explorations of what will fashion look like in 2082 you know like what's the couture of that will we be grafting it onto our bodies what will we what will be the new materials that we can grow so it was an exploration outside of the lab and slowly the practice moved into I was much more interested in what can we do now what can my skills as a textile designer bring to the actual practice of the of actually working in the lab itself with those materials and those processes rather than being removed from it so the other two images on this slide were me taking a tissue engineering technique and using it in the design studio so this is a process called decellularization where you strip and it's used in it's been researched in regenerative medicine to for organ replacement so you remove all of the cells from something like a, a heart or a, a liver or something like that and you're just left with the scaffold so it's things like collagen and elastin and then you use that as a blueprint or a structure to put a patient's own cells onto so that they grow into that that structure and it's supposed to reduce the amount the chance of rejection they're not there yet it's still very much in development but I was using it to create new materials so I was decellularizing bacon um, that had that had gone off, that was no longer edible, and I was trying different techniques. So, dyeing, tanning, printing. I made a jewelry collection. So the middle uh, image is a set of material boards or material samples that I created, and that was called decellular. And then the image on the right hand side was oat bacon, which was a series of jewelry pieces which were made from decellularized bacon, bone powder freshwater pearls. So it was really about taking something from the tissue engineering lab and using it in a design studio. And then the work really transitioned into bringing a textile and uh, design and craft uh, methodology and approach into the laboratory itself. Um, so I started uh, with conversations with uh, uh, Lucy, uh, scientific supervisor, and they were very interested in trying to repair certain parts of the body. So they were looking at the anterior cruciate ligament, which is a very key ligament in your knee to stop your knee from sort of collapsing. I think footballers tear it quite a lot. Um, and it's very difficult to fix. So I was looking at structures and I was trying to mimic those with um, embroidery. And the reason embroidery is looked at in tissue engineering is because you can mimic natural structures within the body. So with knit, if you, you know, you if you, cut it, it will unravel and it stretches. Weave is obviously at a right angle and if you cut it, it frays. Whereas embroidery, you have much more control over the structures that you make. So I was fascinated by, you know, centuries old, you know, stitches we've been using for a very long time, you know, running stitch, satin stitch being used to repair the body. So this was um, digitally embroidered scaffolds using silk fibers and silk suture threads to uh, looking at mimicking sort of, um, ligament structures. So this is where I started and then you can see that on the left they're in culture so with cells um growing on them and they are fibroblast cells i was working with which is skin cells um, and then the image on the right all of the bright green are um the indicate where cells are so they are fluorescing under a fluorescent microscope and you can actually it's actually on one individual piece of silk suture thread so that gives you some idea of the scale um 
But one of the things I learned very quickly through these processes is that I didn't know anywhere near enough to go this complicated this quickly. Um, and so I, I mean, every, and I had problems from everything from scaffolds floating and then they get, and when things get dry, cells die. So I even just practically how to make things work was a huge learning curve. I went in thinking I was going to be growing, I can grow skin in the lab. Surely I'll be growing big bits of leather and it will be really easy and brilliant um so I had a lot it was a steep learning curve um and what I really began to understand was that it I, I was asking questions that were for me I had to get my head around scale and that was really really important so I was making things which I would consider very small pieces of textile that are two-dimensional but actually when you get down to a cellular a cell level things you can't see with the naked eye they're actually very three-dimensional and they're huge comparatively but to me they seem like very very small structures that I was using to as a scaffolding so trying to control where cells would attach and how they'd attach but I realized I didn't understand enough to be going that complicated so what I learned was one of the key learnings of the PhD was actually how big's a cell and how does that relate to the size of a fiber? So mm -hmm. actually the cells I was working with are about the diameter of an individual fiber within a yarn or a thread. So 0.2 uh, of a millimeter. So things you can't really see with your naked eye. So you, the structures that you need to make to really control how cells, where they attach, how they attach is at the fiber level. So then you need to, then it makes a difference how you twist your yarn. And then it makes a difference how that yarn gets put into a structure. So understanding the, the scale and structure relationship from a fiber through to an end textile sort of uh, scaffold was one of the really key learnings. And then it became very, and then I was really using textile craft techniques. So hand takes, I moved away from a machine and I was using my uh, sort of embroidery um, and really couture sort of hand techniques to create scaffolds that I could iterate on very quickly. Um, so sort of understanding, okay, so this was uh, individual fibers here and you, the red cells. So you can see on the right hand one, that's one cell aligning along an individual fiber. So that really started to shift my understanding of what I was making and how I was making it. Um, so I was exploring, first of all, I looked at lots of different textile fibers, what will cells attach to and what won't they? And then how do you take, well, the ones that they will attach, how do you understand how to build structure off of that? Um, and I was doing a lot of recording as well. So um, as Carol was talking about the my lab book and also post, that at the end of um, when I've been doing experiments, how to record them, because I found that a lot of protocols that were written in scientific journals were, they miss a lot out. There's a lot of skill and like tacit skill that you have, like to go with your hands that makes a real difference. It's like giving everyone the same recipe for a cake. You're not gonna get the same thing at the end of it. So I was trying to really um record my results from all the scaffolds and the materials that I was working with in a way that could potentially be a resource for other designers following sort of in my footsteps into the lab so it was first it was getting that understanding and then it was how do I record that to uh sort of pass that knowledge on which was a few we've talked about um already and then some of the final pieces of the PhD were scaffolds where I was really controlling and orienting cell growth. So dictating where the cells would attach and how they would grow. So this is a three stranded braid on the left hand side. You can see the red pieces are all uh, muscle cells. And on the right, I worked with an illustrator to create illustrations that showed the work I was doing. So the structure, where the cells were and how they were aligning on a scaffold, because most of the work I was doing, you can't actually see with your naked eye. Oh, they'd, and I have to they don't have any immune system, so you have to um, sort of essentially sort of kill your your um, your, your uh, samples before you can take them out of the lab and things. You so I was really because I was interested in structure. I wasn't growing huge pieces that you could see. It was more about understanding that orientation and um, alignment. And I was also bringing in I did different textile knowledge sort of technique ideas into the creation of scaffolds. So ideas like resist where you might use that for resist dyeing where you will stop dye attaching in certain areas of a textile. I was using um, a mix of 
materials, some which were very biocompatible and cells love to grow on and some where they wouldn't grow at all. So I was controlling where they would attach and what they'd attach to and then how they would grow. So this was a, um, a braid that had a piece of nylon monofilament that ran through it, which the cells didn't want to attach to. So it was really using textile craft, um, back to one, to, uh, processes to create structures and understanding. So it was, it was about really taking it back to a craft perspective and a making perspective of understanding your materials, how they work into structure and then building up to making different things. Whereas tissue engineering is very often very top down. It's like, we need to fix this part of the body. So we're gonna find materials that have maybe already been used. We know how, what the structure we're going to create and then we'll build downwards. I was I'm not looking to replace any particular type of piece of the body or make any particular type of um, textile for couture. I just want to understand what materials work how structure has an effect. And then I could build different things off of that. So it was a very different approach to the traditional approach used within tissue engineering. And that was a big part of a textile methodology being used and a craft methodology being used in the lab. And then I was also creating pieces like tools that helped me do that work. So, I mean, there's a very good reason, um, scientific reason why petri dishes are round. I always forget what that is but it, I didn't need them to be round. Uh, so I was using things like create, using cell strainers and using them as embroidery hoops, which is something on the top right. I was creating um, different petri dishes, which were based on like an embroidery hoop to hold things in place that they wouldn't float and I could change the media e easily. So it was both creating structures, but also making tools that helped me do that, that work. Um, and so that's a, and it's a whistle top, stop tour through some of my work. And there's a lot of complex, um, things in there. So I hope I've explained that all uh, in a way that makes sense. And just a you know big thank you to the support from uh, Central St Martins and Carol and Kings because it was wouldn't have been possible without any of that. Yes. No. Thank you. Thank you so much, Amy. Actually, it was super clear. And I mean, I have to say, I don't know anything about bio. You know design and tissue and all tissue engineering and any of that. So thank you. It was quite quite um, clear. <laughs> Um, I go very deep very quickly and I forget the <laughs> rabbit hole so <laughs> no it, it was beautiful thank you and absolutely fascinating um can you tell us I mean you touch upon it a few times you know the struggles and and all that but I want the nitty-gritty I want this to be kind of you know very honest what was the real struggles throughout? I mean, I know the start of actually getting to understand scale, you know, how it works and the three-dimensionality of it all. Like, of course, that would be a big um, struggle at the start, but throughout your research, can you tell us a little bit, not just the struggles, I mean, I'm, I don't want to be negative, um, but also like the surprises, those moments where you were like, oh, you know, I get it, or wow, you know, this, the, the bulb clicked. Can you tell us a little bit about those? Yeah, definitely. I mean, I think that I'll start with one of the surprises because it's something that you said really rem reminded me of one. And it was, and it's a, I think it happens no matter whether you're doing a PhD, whatever stage you're at and whatever you're doing is that you get so focused on what you're doing and you're like, you bang your head against it constantly. Like if I just keep going at it and someone has someone like get hold of me, like yank you back and just say like, take a step back and think about things for a moment. And that was a conversation with Carol and she's like, why are you sort of ignoring your design or not ignoring, but why are you not really leaning into your design and your craft skills? Because that's what makes you unique in the lab. Because I think when you, when you first start, I mean, definitely I felt this when I was working in a lab you almost want to become you feel like you need to become a scientist mm -hmm. and you, you're like I need to know everything and then you have to realize that you, I didn't need a, a PhD in tissue engineering I needed to know enough to have conversations with people who had PhDs in tissue engineering and to do my own work but the reason I was there was to bring a craft perspective in and the minute that happened and I stopped trying to I was using digital embroidery a lot which I had done through had had sort of specialized in through as well as hand embroidery through my undergraduate the minute I really took a step back and lent into the textile craft processes and thinking about what that would bring and an ability to create scaffolds in a very fast iterative way and think about what the handmade allowed you to do in regards to creating structure that was a moment but it, I had to it was definitely something where I had to step back because I was just trying to yeah be really go too complex too soon and 
trying to become a scientist. Um, and it's a really easy thing to do. And you have to sort of have a balance because you also need to make sure that you're working in a way that is scientific so that you can actually prove mm. to some extent what you're doing. Um, so that was a key thing. Um, and so that was a, that was a good, really good surprise moment, but it was something that came through having to like go through a bunch of just sort of not struggling with stuff, but trying to figure things out. Um, and, and I, I think as well is, you know, this is quite um, common to anybody working in biodesign. You know, when you discover the, the, the magic of biology, really, it's yeah. just all you want to do is be in the lab. So, oh, what happens when you do this? And and it's very easy to lose your design hat and your creative hat because you're just focused on, on this amazing world of biology, which, you know, is I discovered, Damien, you know, it's when you fall in it, it's just, you yeah. fall in love with it. It's just really incredible. But I think what was really interesting as well is, and, and I think that's common to all PhDs is, you know, you have eventually to contribute to new knowledge, you know, is constantly saying, where's the new knowledge? And, and that creates a little bit of, you know, fear and panic. And, you know, when do you hit something that is qualified, that we can qualify as significant new knowledge? Where is that new knowledge? And in the case of, of Amy, because it was a, a very much a hybrid, you know, between tissue engineering, hardcore scientific um, advancement of knowledge and between textile craft. So the knowledge could have been in different parts. And I think that one of the transformative moments is, is when Amy who'd been working a lot with um, machine embroidered, embroidered uh, scaffold, which is what tissue engineering uses. Tissue engineering in regenerative medicine uses machine made, textile scaffold mm -hmm. and there's one point where we, I remember we had I remember exactly where we were sitting even when yeah. that happened we just thought drop the machine get yeah. the hand back in there mm -hmm. and then we had this conversation around the why machine because that's what they are doing already and they're doing it with one mostly one material one textile material and then that's where we said oh hold on a second you know you have an incredible hand in embroidery knowledge you have an incredible knowledge about different fiber types. You know, we talked about eventually moving to the archive, going from milk fiber to soya bean fiber and mm -hmm. try other potential fibers for their compatibility, which science wasn't looking at. Mm -hmm. But I think that's where we just thought, okay, well, where is the strengths in, 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 in the knowledge that Amy already has that could become a platform for new knowledge in that field? And I think the idea of, you know, dropping the machine made to move more to the handmade and the grow made mm. was really significant because I think it was quite liberating. Oh, yeah, suddenly, completely. Like, oh, yes, that's where we can begin something new there. And I remember Lucy, uh, Lucy De Silvio, the, the, the um, head of that department who was the, the supervisor, also said, yes, why not looking at this? Because this is really where, not to say that, you know, craft doesn't, in, you know, you can do machine stitch as a craft, but the idea of hand crafting, hand embroidering with um, live cells became a very powerful, um, inspirational departure. And, and I think after that, everything fell in place. If I remember well, that was the sort of transformative moment. Mm -hmm. And then everything suddenly from that, um, um, developed into making the tools as well, which I think was critical for this. Yeah, and no, it really was, and it was, it was, yeah, it was the transformation moment, and it just came from just taking a step back and trying to look at things rather than just solving the, the immediate sort of technical problem that's in front of you or, or whatever was happening. And but I think just to touch on things, I one of the larger things I struggled with, which is tied into the conversation that we've just been having is because the PhD sat at the intersection of different fields, I always felt like I was never doing quite enough in any one of them, that I wasn't going, I wasn't being scientifically rigorous enough in tissue engineering, that I hadn't gone deep enough in the contextual historical textile craft reading and theory that I needed to do, or the, the sort of emerging field of um, biofabrication and living design it always felt like I was a little bit I always felt like I wasn't doing enough in every area and I always could have done I was like I need to do an entire literature review on every single area and it was just that was the things that always felt I struggled with a lot was when you work in the middle of something how do you do enough in each 
and where do you draw the boundaries of what you're including in something like a literature review or what you include in your thesis and what you don't include um and of course that's all really important thinking to also articulate within your thesis but um that was definitely a, a, a struggle it, it, it that did also shift and was definitely helped by the the, the decision to really lean into the handmade but throughout it was always something that I I struggled with. So you know this is so interesting because I, I kept thinking of your research and I was like well it's it's a very scientific research if you look at it in the the aspect of the tissue you know the lab you were at King's but at the end you were based at CSM you mm -hmm. still had that kind of design and crafts as the core of your research um, mm -hmm. It's just that you were using tools that's, you know, set within um, within the scientific field. Now, have you? Did you feel that because you you came from this creative background, you came from design primarily? Mm -hmm. Do you think that created particular outcomes that somebody say with a, a scientific background wouldn't have reached otherwise? I mean. I think so. Um, yeah, I, I think, know so. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Yeah. Um, and, it, and, and it was also, it, that was from a number of different reasons, but I think it's definitely in the same way that if you brought a scientist into a design university and asked them to do whether they would approach mm -hmm. the types of techniques and tools and processes that we have in a very unique way, because they don't come with all of the baggage and the pre-learnt the, you know when you go through a creative education that like you come with all of that and that's how you and you're taught to think about things in certain ways and approach problems in certain ways so I that definitely I bring me bringing that into the lab was meant I approached things um very much from a design uh into craft perspective also I had was very lucky to really uh, a lot of freedom which I think a lot of scientists don't, aren't always afforded where you are attached to a research grant and you're looking at something very specific like you might be looking at, okay how do we fix this particular type of bone defect or something you know like how do you fix a certain artery or, or grow this type of cell on this type of material I went in and I could look at whatever not whatever whatever I wanted to I could approach it and explore things that felt that they were rich mm -hmm. um areas to do so um and that was something that really helped my perspective as well because you know I went and I was like okay I'm just going to trial loads of different types of textile like materials every, and things that don't need to they don't need to I mean no one's going to use mohair to in to implant it in the body mm -hmm. but maybe it'll work for couture textiles so I was liberated because I wasn't trying to fix a certain problem um and then also the outcomes really came from that because it was not i didn't have an end and part of the contribution to knowledge was the bottom-up approach of craft which is understand your materials your techniques your processes and then you build what you want to build from that as opposed to a top down we're going to try and make x how do we do that which is a sort of scientific approach to tissue engineering a lot of the time Yes, no, absolutely. And so would you say then that um, a practice based research, because that's what um, at the end, what um, the exhibition is about and what your work is about is a good example of it. So do you think this practice based, this um, freedom that you're allowed to test, to to push, to challenge, you know, to bring in unusual uh, materials because you could, do you think that also gives um, the the creates unique outcomes they are much more kind of widespread and much more kind of flexible do you think practice base has something to add then to research oh, 100 absolutely 100 percent. i think it would i couldn't have on a really practical level i couldn't have done and it created the knowledge that was created without that practice and i and i think i know the way that i research is through doing so i had to it was in, imperative to do the practice um and and i also believe because design phds are are younger than mm -hmm. a, a lot of um other sort of disciplines that's a good and a bad thing it's bad in that not many, not as many people have done it so you have less maybe to look at in regards to methodology or approaches but the flip side of that is that you're not 
things are not prescribed to you in the same way so that you can use your practice and develop a methodology, that, methodology that's specific to you and you are fig, a, a lot of figuring out as you go I think can be both scary and challenging but also helps because it's really yours and you can you're not being sort of dictated to even if you wouldn't you're not you really shouldn't think that in whichever discipline you're working in but you you can't help but be influenced by all the other research that you read and and approaches that people have taken yes well, absolutely and carol how how do you support then practice-based research because there's so much freedom involved it can also as as daunting it can be for the researcher you know sometimes not having to rely them on on anything prescribed how do you then go about supporting the research i actually fundamentally disagree with what you've just said oh okay uh, <laughs> you said practice base is, is just a lot of freedom and there's no no actually there isn't a lot of freedom mm -hmm. um and I think what I mean was referencing is, is more freedom than the scientists in their labs having to follow established protocols mm -hmm. uh, to have a set of reliable da data. I think the freedom was that she didn't have to prove or disprove a hypothesis in the way a scientist would. Mm -hmm. um, or what was interesting in Amy's um, PhD is that there was a very clear uh, research question, which is fundamental. Without a good research question, you can't uh, go into innovation and new knowledge. But the way Amy went about it was not to just do one type of experiment repeated 500 times to try and get somewhere. She developed a series of mini projects that mm -hmm. each poked at the question and each sort of uh, answered a different part of the question and sort of built on. on. So she, she built a a body of knowledge that is articulated around that particular question. But it's, I would say there's very little freedom in a PhD. You've got your research question, you have to stick to it, you have to answer it. And the answer could be no, the answer could be yes. But um, yeah, so, so it's really fundamental for me that we, we're not kind of implying to the audience here that practice based means you do what you want because no everything is dictated by the research question mm -hmm. the other thing i'd like to say is you know we talk a lot about practice based or theory based phds when we work in the arts i have to say i mean you know i'm completely for practice based because i think we make knowledge through making Mm -hmm. I understand the world around me through my making. It's for me, it's, it's fundamental. But if you look at the history of humanity, you know, we talked about the Bronze Age because that's when we mastered bronze making. So we define epoch in the way we, we relate to human history in relation to what we mastered um, up till now. We know in the Anthropocene where we just completely mastered the disruption of the climate. Um, you can speak for us about that, but um, I think we need to question why are we calling calling it practice based. You know, if you if you're doing a PhD in biology, mm -hmm. you spend all your time in the lab making mm -hmm. up ex practical experiments to derive uh, knowledge from. It's not called a practice based biology PhD. Mm -hmm. So I think for me, the fact that we call it practice based versus theory based still implies a hierarchy. Mm. which is best theory based or practice based knowledge doesn't work like that mm -hmm. knowledge is much more integrated than that um, and I think that's what Amy did very well you know there's a complete integration of understanding the intellectual theoretical um, ground working work of, of the notion of making mm -hmm. um, but also understanding the, the theoretical research behind tissue engineering but the knowledge is through making Mm -hmm. not through um, you know, the more theoretical advancement, but it's definitely not about freedom. And where I help and, and where uh, as a supervisor is a bit of, an, I mean, my disagree, but it's a, it's a lot of support and nurture and, and, a, and a lot of challenge. Mm. How about this and what about this? And as well as, yeah, this is really interesting. So because we don't have that, that answer either, you know, we're just here because we know the process of the PhD. We know what milestones you need to, to mm -hmm. reach and when. And we know when you, you know, when a student will hit that new knowledge. But usually there's a lot of anxiety around mm -hmm. where and when am I doing something new? And I have to say most of the time and across all the PhD, and I can see we have another one of... Um, 
my PhD, Elena, is in the audience, is when is there a new knowledge? And I think when you are in the midst of your own PhD, it's quite hard to see that. So it's often the supervision team is able to say, but did you realize this? He's here and this is that. So we, we give a bit of that perspective and that distance as well to try and help understanding better. The PhD journey is a bit of a um solitary journey you know you you kind of you, you don't meet your supervision team every week you meet them you know two three times a term mm -hmm. and so you have to drive your project the complexity of the project all the unknown and the unforeseen um you know happy moments as well as unhappy moments you have to manage on your own because it's part of what you need to learn completely independence in in driving a research project it's effectively a research training so you can then manage complex research projects um, but I think what we need to do really as, as, as um, supervisors is helping point out the gaps and helping most of the time point out the successes yeah. which students tend to not see because they're just so involved in and so focused they just forget how amazing it is you know what they're doing so quite often it's about wow but this is really interesting here and you haven't noticed that so it's that, yeah, support and challenge role really is what we're there. And then just making sure that uh, the structure of the PhD is, is followed through. Yes, I, mean, I definitely agree with that. I, I remember looking at the PhDs that were happening, the PhDs who were doing their work in the lab, and thinking there isn't that distinction. And that there was actually a lot to be learned from the sort of engineering science PhDs, other PhDs which involve practical work, which is held in the highest esteem and, and is essential to the creation of knowledge um, and that's there's a lot to be learned from that I think when you're when you're doing uh, work that is practical um, and it also helps you feel uh, more confident in your when you say I've created when I'm creating new knowledge I think because we are not necessarily trained in design to really explain our methodology to record things it feels like because it becomes a it's quite innate a lot of the stuff we do we do um, through, we do have methodology, we just don't, we don't necessarily talk about it. It feels sometimes a bit uncomfortable to say that this is new knowledge because it feels so intrinsically linked to you and instinctual sometimes that it feels, you're like, well, how do I prove that? Or is it new knowledge? And it, you, it, you definitely, you need your supervisory team to get you to, again, step back and look at what you've done and get you to really sort of explain the sort of steps and but also, I mean, we haven't discussed it here, but, you know, you have to do a, a, what we call a literature uh, review and a practice review. So you have to know the who's who in the particular field you're uh, mm -hmm. situating your practice within, because you need to know what is the latest knowledge in that space to make sure you can contribute to the next bit of new knowledge. Um, so there's a lot of knowledge to maintain as well, which is not your own making, your own. it's just keeping up to date with what's going on in your field. Mm -hmm. You know, reading journals, reading papers, going to conferences. In the case of Femi, she was very cleverly using, um, you know, developing a project. It was, um, you know, invited to showcase in exhibitions, speaking at conferences, gaining feedback uh, from all of this was a way to evaluate the practice and get a sense of. So she actually used a lot of this sort of um, uh, speaking at conferences and exhibiting her work as a means to evaluate and iterate her work as well, which not everybody does that. Some people want to keep their PhD confidential. Mm -hmm. But in the case of Amy, it was just all about testing it, seeing how, what happens, how is it perceived, where does it go? And then that would inform the next um, um, practice um, in the lab. Oh, absolutely, thank you. Now I'm very conscious that when you're having, you know, you're, you're having those amazing conversations, time does go really, really fast. Um, so should I open now for maybe a couple of questions from our audience? Um, questions to Amy, questions to Carol, questions about research, questions about Amy's research, just opening up perhaps for a couple. So I'm just looking at the comments, um, Isabella, and there's a nice comment from Katharina uh, saying, I agree with Carl's point, the distinction of practice and theory uh, based PhD is superfluous. Um, Katharina, do you want to come in and, and comment on that a bit more? Sure, sorry, I'm trying to, 
unmute myself. Um, yes, I think um, I, I really liked uh, Carol's point and uh, also thank you, Carol and Amy for these uh, um, really uh, interesting and thought provoking conversation. Uh, that, um, yeah, we distinguish between a practice based, practice led, a theory, uh, PhDs, but uh, really what, what we are doing is uh, um, asking questions and trying to find ways to address this question through different, different practices. Um, and maybe what we have is uh, that uh, writing, uh, uh, making, uh, our uh, thinking are all practices. Mm -hmm. Yes, no, that's a very good point. Um, do we have any questions from the audience? We don't uh, at this moment, um, so why don't you continue um, and I'll let you know when there are some questions. Not a question. <laughs> okay, well, I have plenty of questions um, <laughs> that I can keep going until people, but yes, for our audience, please do, um, you're more than welcome and we, we do want to hear from you. So if you want to, you know, there's no stupid questions ever. Um, so just ask away, but I'll continue on. Okay, so Amy, you've done it. You completed your PhD in 2020. It does sound like it was, a you know, an incredible journey, but also one of, you know, lots of learning throughout and having to rethink and question. But well done, you did it. Um, <laughs> what does life look like now i mean yeah it was definitely um so i when i first started i was i want to do it full time this is what i wanted to do and then i ended up getting funding for part time and i said like, okay and actually i am so glad i did it that way it was the best thing decision that i didn't took but had to sort of make um uh, partly because it kept my mind I did other things part of the times so that helped me not just get sucked into the bubble of just focusing on the research, I think can be helpful and sometimes unhelpful. Um, also just that it just takes time to grow things that you can't, you can't rush biology. So having time to do that was great. Um, and then I was lucky. I was very fortunate to get um, a role in a biotech company in the fields when I had, so that was 2016 and I moved to New York to do that. And, but I had just finished my, so they gave me a bit of time to finish off the practical work, which I was almost done with. And then I thought, I mean, working at a startup and writing up like that, that'll be fine. Um, funnily enough, it took a little bit longer than I expected it to. Um, and they were very supportive and gave me gave me space some space to do that but it's you know it's, it was a different it was a difficult thing to juggle um so I was actually working whilst finishing off the PhD so that was a really I so I was I sort of took a bet that I hoped that there would be a role for me in this this kind of this sort of industry um but what I took and the technology that I was working with and I was working in the lab with sort of material scientists bringing a sort of design and product perspective into the development of materials it wasn't the technology that I'd worked with, sort of tissue engineering, but it was what was the transferable skill was the methodology and way of approaching working in a lab and developing materials and collaborating with scientists, which was the, the real skill that sort of helped me in that in that transition into working uh, sort of professionally in the field. So my transition was as sort of almost like post PhD happened whilst I was trying to finish off the writing part to PhD, which possibly wasn't the best way around, but. <laughs> no, I, I can't imagine. Can you tell us a little bit about what you do today? Like with, with your, your job? Yeah, so, I mean, now we work, um, so I work with, we work with sort of startups, brands and some investors who are looking to um, either develop, implement or invest in these uh, new, uh, these new materials so a lot of it is consulting some of it's sort of some material development work but really helping to sort of educate the field and move the field forward um so 
sort of across the board with lots of different um, sort of startups and brands. And I think a lot of the time it's a transla translational role um, where you have people that, that you can put a scientist, a sort of a scientific founding team and a design team in the room and they're just, they're gonna, they're gonna talk like this, mm -hmm. you know, because it, it may, things mean there's different terminology. People don't understand feedback in the same way. So there's a lot of work, which is just translational as well to help um, move things, hopefully move things forward faster. Yeah, and um, how does your research sit within within that and, and, and the kind of the bigger context of biodesign of, you know, this new way of thinking about materials? And actually a question for both of you, it's how biodesign then sits within this whole context of climate and environmental emergency. So, you know, what is the, bigger picture how we do apply this amazing research and the findings and you know these new materials that you've been considering these new ways of creating and you have said you've been thinking about how it applies to say couture but also you know medical teams and things how does it sit within the bigger picture yeah i mean it's a it's a really good question i mean i think i I realized relatively quickly when I was really working with tissue engineering that it's not something that's going to solve our planetary issues anytime soon as a, that specific technology. There are people looking at it to grow things like replacement for leather. It's hugely, re it's very actually very resource intensive in regards to like single use plastic because things have to be sterile. You can't, there are things you can do. Scaling it up is very challenging. Um, so there are others who are using other types of organisms like bacteria and yeast or mycelium. They are much more scalable, much more readily scalable. So it, it was, it was for me, it was, there were not, there, and that's not a simple process and there's not to say that there aren't issues that you have to watch out for in that process. Mm -hmm. uh, but mammalian sort of using cells and cell culture um, maybe has more application for food, uh, but you have to look at, I think there's a across the board working with living, sort of living systems and biofabrication is that we have to go le several levels deeper rather than just assuming that bio equals better. It's like people assuming that natural dyes are therefore like fine for the planet. You have to go, you have to look at the entirety of your process. Like what are you feeding your organism? Like how much power does it take? What water do you use? What's its end of life? Um, if you're blending it with something, what effect does that have? So you I think it's about, for me, it was seeing my research as sitting in a way of thinking about designing with living mm -hmm. organisms and creating and how do you bring, making sure that what you're developing is sort of fit for the purpose and better than what we've got and better is a, you know, a loaded word, but um, better than what we are, we currently have, because it's got to be otherwise the point, the point of making it. But I don't Carol, what would you? Yeah, no. Um... Uh, uh, well, I think your own PhD wasn't really focused on ecology because I think there's two aspects of biodesign research. One is to try and, you know, think about the applications, but the other is uh, just a new knowledge in the mechanics of how things work when you work with biology, the methods and how you make things interface is, new, is knowledge we need to gain and, and grow. Um, so, uh, but when the question to do is how does biodesign relate to, you know, the bigger climate um, and biodiversity question. For me, and you know, the Living Systems Lab is really funded on, on the notion that you know we need to learn from nature. So it's very much a biomimicry uh, approach, looking at what we can learn from natural uh, systems and how nature biofabricates. And when you think of you know uh, a biological system operates at ambient temperature, it's cyclic, uh, it's zero waste. Uh, actually, waste is a nutrient, um, and um, it operates with local nutrients. It doesn't have to travel, you know, back and forth across the globe to try and harvest its little bit. And, and it's in that sense that we need to learn from biology. And the idea of biodesign is how can we learn from biological systems and in integrate them in our design concepts and design systems. And you can actually directly bio-integrate um, biology in, in, in the way you operate, or you can reference biology. So you could look at um, you know, what you can learn from swarm behavior that could inform an AI to perform better and with less energy, for instance. So I think there's a, for me, it's the way to go. It's really looking at how we can learn. Biodesign is a real lens and focus lens on how we can learn from nature. Mm -hmm. But I see also a lot of biodesigners out there kind of 
getting into value design because it's sort of cool, it's new, it's a kind of, and 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 I have to say that that really is problematic for me because I think we we can't waste time on just the new for the sake of new. We need to look for what's better, which can lead us to post petrol, post carbon, or mm -hmm. well, pro carbon in a natural way. <laughs> um, you know, because biology eats carbon. Um, but I think we need to really look into how bio design can answer those big questions. But quite often to do that, you need to answer very focused questions. You know, how do we how do we photosynthesize? Is still a question. It's very hard for us to understand how a plant can operate photosynthesis to transform carbon and sugar. We don't really know how to do that. I mean, there's a few labs researching that, but it's, you know, we don't know how to do that. We go and dig petrol, pollute the planet to do it. So I think we have a lot to learn from natural systems. And for me, biodesign is a means to get closer to how nature operates. But the risk is, as Amy said, as soon as humans get into something that may be better, it's in the way it's upscaled. Because if you upscale it in a way that becomes uncontrollable, you know, if you look at conventional agriculture, you know, if you just do permaculture, it's very fine. But if you turn agriculture into monoculture, intensive pesticides, the way we upscale everything we do, then that's problematic. So for me, the key, and this is what we we, we think about in, in the Living Systems Lab, is really having the right mindset. A mindset which is asking questions that can take us a step closer to ecology. Mm -hmm. Um, using this intersection of biology, knowledge and design knowledge and craft knowledge, um, but also knowing it's not easy. It, there isn't a ready-made answer out there. And it's, you know, some processes which are benign and mainstream like photosynthesis, which is everywhere on the planet. Mm -hmm. <clears throat> we don't know how to do that. We don't know how to control that. And we think we are very intelligent species. I think we're not. I think we are, um, very gutist and narcissistic species, but I don't think we're necessarily smarter than a lot of other species out there. Mm -hmm. um, so I think it's for me, it's really important to think about using bio design as a means to research how we can learn from other species, mm -hmm. as opposed to think we're on the top and let, exploit all of them. Let's see what we can learn from each other as humans and as non humans. Of course. No, thank you. Um, okay, uh, can I just jump in at this point? We have a question from Lindsay Gibson, um, who can't uh, be unmuted because she's in the library, so I'll read for her. Um, thank you so much for your presentations. A question for Amy. Uh, what would you say about the benefits of completing a PhD as opposed to working in an interdisciplinary lab? Also, is it difficult to obtain uh, funding for this type of PhD? I mean, it was definitely... Um really beneficial working in an interdisciplinary lab. I think actually the tissue engineering as itself is very interdisciplinary um, in the sense that you have biologists, material scientists. So there's a lot of different um, perspectives coming into one. So that helps you, you're challenged constantly in the way that you approach things. And then of course, being embedded somewhere so like, like Central St. Martin's and the, the Living Systems Lab, you're constantly being, um, I think we're, for me, the interesting stuff happens at the edges of things where it's like the edge of knowledge or the edge of a discipline and, and where things cross over and people questioning your approach because it's, and it's often just the, you do the thing you do because it's the way you've always done it and you haven't necessarily thought about it. So that was really key and definitely helped push the research. And then funding, that's a really good question. Um, I So my practical decision to go part-time was that I, the only funding that, I, so I was applying for funding and I got funding for my fees part-time. So I didn't have to pay. So I was, my fees were covered, but I had to work to sort of support myself alongside the PhD. Um, I just think that in 2012, this was not an area that was necessarily really receiving that much. It was still quite early. It was beginning to emerge, but you know, there wasn't the focus that there is on it now. Um, and it's, generally a little harder to, I think, to find funding if you're not attached to a bigger research project and then if you're attached to a bigger research project you may be lucky and find that they are researching something that you're really interested in but you've got to make sure whatever you pick for your PhD and I remember Carol saying this to me is like you have you're going to become an expert in a very specific thing you have to really be interested in it and love it otherwise it's not going to sustain you through the amount of time you're going to spend on it um so you, you may be lucky to find that you find that within a, 
a research program where there is a uh, sort of a grant for a PhD, which may then will cover some things like living expenses um, and give you a sort of a yeah a, a sort of stipend. Um, or you could go down the route of of looking for funding from a company, but that that's potentially problematic in other ways for a PhD research. Um, so it, it's a tricky one. Um, and uh, I might add a little bit to this and maybe Marketer and Katerina can too, but this is actually one of my frustration. There's a lot of uh, very good funding for PhDs in science. There's very little or hardly nothing for PhDs in design. Um, and you can get companies and industry sponsoring PhDs, but then you tend to not own your IP. And then one of the things we, um, we really value at, at Santa Sosa Martins is that you own your intellectual property. Um, and when you join an, uh, a research grant or where you apply for um, an advertised PhD, then usually you, you're not in control anymore of your IP, which might not necessarily be, a, be an issue, but it's something to think about and consider. Um, but I have to say a lot of, uh, actually all my students do their PhDs part-time uh, because the fees are a lot cheaper and because you can work part-time. And I know I often have people coming to me saying, oh, but I really want to do it full-time. And I have to say, I find that the full-time ones, students are more stressed because it's three years full-time and you normally submit your, your thesis and viva in a fourth year, but it sounds long, but it's not. It's really intense and it's very little space for anything going wrong. And when you work in what we work in, uh, you know, with living systems, exactly, things die, <laughs> things go wrong. And so actually to have a little bit of um, part-time is it's five years normally. I mean, because Amy got a job before she finished. <laughs> it took a bit longer, but it's normally five years. And five years goes really fast too. I don't remember Amy, it's super fast. Yeah. But also you don't have the same pressure because if something goes wrong, you can make up the time in the five years a lot more than in the three years. Um, so I think for me, I, I try and I normally kind of say, you know, part-time is a really good way to do it. Um, I would recommend anyone do it part-time. Obsessed and you, you, you have time to see your friends. <laughs> you can do yes. other things. Um, so I think part-time sounds long, but actually it's so far, I mean, I think it's, it tends to be quite a positive experience to yeah. be part-time as well. It really was for me. I was going to say this late it's time. Sorry, Melissa. <laughs> There's a bit of a delay. I was just saying, yeah, it's, it's I found it because you could also, I could do like a month in the lab and then go and work on a, do some work for a month. So it wasn't necessarily that you had to split your, obviously your time. Like I do two and a half days on my PhD and then I do, like it was, it was really um, helpful to be able to be flexible. Yeah, we, I mean, I like to be quite flexible because I think it's important that you you manage your time in a way that's uh, constructive and creative and efficient. Mm -hmm. And it's different for different uh, PhDs. And now you can just meet online. So even when Amy was in New York, we could carry on the supervision mm -hmm. online anyway. Um, so I think f for us, what matters is to create the, the you know, a, 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 a space conducive to learning and creativity and, and sort of, you know, enjoying um, that research inquiry and, and the documentation of that inquiry. Yes, I was just going to say um, when you were talking about time, uh, I was quite amused by Amy sort of evoking the imposter syndrome in the PhD where you never feel like you are the expert in the, in the disciplines or fields that you're connecting. And I'm finding that with my PhD students as well that actually three years is not very long. Um, and it's a real struggle to kind of master your, your fields, especially if there's more than one. And often our students are cross-disciplinary almost always. Um, so it's very much kind of about getting the focus from the beginning and being very clear about just how much you need to draw from each and every field and discipline. But I also loved um, Amy talking about being at the edges and I think you evoked it as well, Carol. And I just wondered whether you feel um, that artists and designers are very good at this, that this is something that we do well, being at the edges and kind of poking and probing around, um, you know, because I suppose in comparison with science-based PhDs, we don't have that sort of very clear purpose and a clear, you know, hypothesis that we try to prove, but often it's about exploring and finding questions as much as the answers to them. Um, so can we try to generalize something about how practice as research or, or practice-based research 
um, finds answers differently or, or, you know, kind of finds knowledge differently? Is there something we could say more generally about this? Well, for me, it's something I push for. <clears throat> I like to push at, at MA level and PhD level. At, you know, being at the edge of knowledge is, is very seductive. Um, because you know it's it's where you beginning at the beginning of a new knowledge as well, um, but it's where you are the intersection of different fields, um, and and I think that's where you know if you're too comfortable, if you feel that you know too much, then I think a question's not good enough. I think you're not asking something that's going to be original and significant, um, and I think it's only when you go on the you know on the extreme kind of textile craft and in tissue engineering it's at that edge of craft and that edge of tissue engineering that you can find a really interesting new 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 zone a new place to be and and i think for me that's what i find very exciting is just to be at the edge of knowledge um it's something i i, I talk about to you know more at ma level and phd level but it's um i find it quite an inspirational aspirational place to be Thank you. Now, I think it's it's that very sad point in the conversation when you just want to keep going, but unfortunately, time constraints um, ask us to, to kind of start finish up. So I just wanted to thank Lindsay for your question. Um, that was actually quite a, a very interesting and, and practical question. So thank you very much. And Marquetta as well, I know um, you, you're here to, to help me, but actually I, I really enjoy your um, own kind of perspective and, and you know, you, you also had a PhD that you completed not very long ago. So this is all perhaps a bit fresh still for you, but you also see the other side where you supervise your students. So thank you very much as, as well for your contributions. And I would also like to, well, first and foremost, to thank our panelists, Amy and Carol. Thank you so much. I mean, Amy, your research is absolutely fascinating. And I wish we could spend another hour and a half just hearing everything about the, the, the gritty details of everything is absolutely fascinating. So congratulations. Thank you so much. I mean, it's, a, it's a, been such a joy to talk about it and also to talk about the just the mechanics of doing a PhD and, and what that that looks like because it's um yeah it's definitely a solitary thing to do so having these types of conversations I think is really important and I'm so thrilled to be in the exhibition because that's really important so vital as well to see research celebrated and explored and presented in a way because it's um it's so rich and varied uh, at, at UAL so yeah well thank you and Carol of course thank you um Maybe I'm thanking for Amy a little bit, but um, you know your your support sounds like it was incredibly. Um, you know, I, I love how you you tend to challenge. You 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 know you you like to ask the right questions here as well. You challenge me. You challenge obviously Amy. And thank you, thank you so much. It wouldn't have been the same this conversation, of course, without you. Then I would also like to thank um, Lynn Linton for. Um, making sure Zoom was working out, the technical sides of this conversation happened so smoothly. So Lynn, thank you very much. Katerina and Marquetta, thank you for um, inviting me to be part of this. Um, and, and of course, for being here and contributing with your own comments. Um, so thank you, everybody. And then I would also like to remind all of you that you can see Amy's research alongside lots of other incredibly um, interesting research at the exhibition, Invisible Processes, and the exhibition is opened um, and it's at Central St. Martin's Letherby Gallery and it's open until the 22nd of January 2022. Um, so do come, do come see Amy's research and everybody else's research. We also have um, loads of very, very interesting talks and panels as part of the exhibition. And this was one of them, um, this conversation, but there are also many, many other in conversations happening. So do have a look. I think um, Lynn or Maketa have put the link um, in the chat. So have a look. We have really, really fantastic um, conversations coming up. Um, the, the program around the exhibition is just as rich as the exhibition itself. So do have a look. And then thank you everybody for joining us this evening i hope you found it interesting i hope you found it helpful if you are thinking of doing a phd soon i hope this has inspired you 
uh, it certainly has inspired me. So I will be looking at <laughs> the process now. Um, but yes, thank you very much, everybody. And I do hope you have a fantastic evening. <laughs>